Hi, I'm Edwin Rutsch, and this is Dialogues on Building a Culture of Empathy, and I'm here today with Rian Eisler. Uh, thanks, Rian, for uh, joining me. Pleasure to be with you. So I wanted to uh, introduce you first. Um, you're, uh, you, I mean, you've done so much, it's really quite amazing. You're a social scientist, an attorney, an author on cultural transformation, an activist leader in the uh, peace movement, as well as uh, around caring. Uh, you're a speaker at, at work and do workshops, and you're also the author of um, The uh, Real Wealth of Nations, uh, Creating a Caring Economics. And, and uh, Yes. And also you have a website. It's the uh, Center for Partnership Studies. So that's partnershipway.org, and you have your uh, website also, Rian, Eisler.com. So uh, those are two resources uh, that people can uh, connect with you on. So um, what we want to talk about is is really what is the relationship of empathy and caring, and how do we uh, create a culture of empathy and caring? So that's uh, our topic for the next twenty minutes or so. Well, uh, how do we do that? <laughs> uh, we do it through human agency. Uh, that's the only way that we have seen uh, change toward human rights, uh, towards greater consciousness, and yes, towards greater empathy. And you know, the book that I'm best known for actually is one you didn't mention. It's The Chalice and the Blade, uh, which is now in 25 languages, most European languages, as well as oh, Chinese, Japanese, Urdu, uh, you name it, Korean, Arabic, and so on. And that was the first book uh, that really uh, I wrote for a general readership about my findings about what kind of culture, because that's the question for our future, uh, what kind of culture will support rather than inhibit our capacities for empathy, for caring, uh, for creativity rather than, because we also have those capacities, uh, for insensitivity, cruelty, violence. And my research, my multidisciplinary cross-cultural research has basically uh, sought answers to this. And I did this by really getting past, uh, you know, Einstein said that you can't solve problems with the same thinking that created them. And so I found very early in my research that the conventional categories of right versus left, or religious versus secular, or Eastern versus Western, or capitalist versus socialist, or northern versus southern, really don't tell us that because uh, I mean, you just think about it, uh, societies in all these categories have been repressive, regressive, violated human rights, and so on. And I found that uh, one of the reasons is that if you look at uh, our human possibilities, which is what my work's about, through these old lenses, they fail to take into account the most fundamental and formative human relations, how those are socially constructed. And by this I mean the relations between the female and male half of humanity uh, and between them and their daughters and sons. And when you take those into account, you begin to see that there are configurations and there were no names for these. Uh, so I called one the domination system and that really you have to compartmentalize at best or suppress at worst uh, our capacity for empathy. But there is another possibility what I call the partnership system. Yeah, so yeah, you have a, a model where you have the kind of domination society and the partnership society, and, you're, and basically you're you're saying that right now we have more of the domination society, and that we need to get past the all the isms, capitalism, communism, and all the other isms to really focus on on creating this partnership society, which is based on empathy and caring, and it's really about the relationships and how people are relating to each other as I understand it. Absolutely, and none of the old categories even ask that question, do they? 
I mean, they, they, don't, they don't address it at all. I mean, will relationships be based on mutual respect, mutual benefit, mutual accountability, and yes, caring, empathy, or will they be rigid rankings uh, of domination, be it man over man, man over woman, that's a huge piece, uh, race over race, religion over religion, and so on. And that, as I said, uh, was what you can only answer really by using the new lenses of the configurations of the partnership and domination systems. And I think we should really start with uh, human evolution when we talk about empathy, don't you think? Uh, yeah, the uh, how em empathy evolved and, and through, through caring, I guess, is where you're heading. Uh, well, maternal I'm, caring, perhaps, and right. Uh, where I'm heading is that if you look at mammals, uh, and probably it did start with the necessity, really, of a mammalian mother uh, to have some empathy for her babies, but it went much, much more beyond that. Uh, we know, for example, from experiments with rats, that they will help rats that they know. Uh, we know uh, from experiments with humans, uh, for example, there was a wonderful experiment uh, done at the Max Planck Institute in Germany, uh, Felix Werneken, and he I had, did this experiment with little toddlers uh, where he would so, I mean supposedly accidentally uh, drop a book or uh, have a, he was hanging some clothes and have the clothes pin and the clothes fa fall down and if it looked like it was an accidental thing, not if he deliberately threw the book down, these little toddlers would toddle over to help. So this capacity to identify with the feelings, right, of another, uh, that's really what empathy is about. But that's only a capacity. Uh, and we know that how behavior develops, how our brains develop really, is through the interaction of our genes with our environments and our, for humans, the most uh, important environments, of course, are cultural, as mediated first of all through families, of course, also through education, religion, politics, economics. So we know that uh, people in these rigid rankings of top-down uh, domination, uh, they, they really can't have empathy for those below them, can they? Because otherwise, how could they suppress and dominate? So always you have to look at the culture. And in a domination system, uh, our capacity for empathy really uh, gets suppressed dampened and we see this don't we in cultures and subcultures that orient to that configuration mm. so oh, sorry, with, with, the, oh, with, the, with the Max Planck study I've seen that and I've seen the video which is online and you can actually see that happening so it's it's showing that children want to naturally uh, contribute to the well-being they want to and kind of and to do that they're empathizing with the person that you know dropped the clothespin or whatever so in a sense that's showing that there's this natural capacity of wanting to contribute and to empathize and that you're saying if I'm hearing it correctly that the authoritarian uh, social structure is is suppressing that sense of empathy it isn't only the authoritarian social structure because one of the key components of domination systems is also the rigid ranking of the male half of humanity over the female half and with this the uh, devaluing of so-called feminine soft traits and activities, and you've got it, such as caring, empathy, you know, real men 
in that system, whether it's in Hitler's Germany or in Khomeini's Iran, uh, whether it's in the Taliban of Afghanistan, uh, Stalin's Soviet Union, real men are supposed to be tough and to not get those soft emotions get in the way right and of course in a very rigid domination system such as a Muslim fundamentalist uh, system honor I mean uh, honor right mm -hmm. uh, is equated with control starting with male control over the women and children in the home and therefore if a woman uh, seems to d d violate that control and it's, it's very much also a sexual control the man is supposed to and and, and he will be helped by women in, in in the family and brothers and you know and others who subscribe to this he he is justified according to this in killing that girl or woman so you are really dealing with a pathological system but by the logic of the system that makes sense doesn't it mm -hmm. uh, so you have to not only consider authoritarian in the tribe or state but in the family and you also have to consider something else remember I said that in domination systems anything stereotypically associated with women with the so-called feminine and I say so-called because this is not about anything inherent in women or men uh, it's you know part of the culture is devalued so empathy caring caregiving are not not at all supposed to be appropriate for quote real men right and uh, they are devalued uh, in social policy as well uh, now in our in the West uh, we have moved uh, significantly to the partnership side if we hadn't we couldn't be having this conversation right yeah I mean, I'm in it, fact I'm doing an interview with someone a woman in in uh, uh, in Pakistan and she doesn't want to be videotaped because uh, she doesn't want to be on camera because she's on camera even with the veil she's uh, afraid of uh, retaliation that's right I mean that see in these cultures respect is really fear and it starts in the family mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. and, and you see but but let me just say something this is not just a Muslim thing this is I mean if you look at some of the parenting books for example by the so-called Christian right like books called parenting with God or parenting God's way or I mean God is is depicted as a sadist you know and little 18 months old babies are terrorized into sitting on high chairs with their hands folded in front of them well the only way you do that is by frightening that child of terrible punishment isn't it because it's totally unnatural but that's what see domination systems children learn two lessons first in that family they learn to equate difference beginning with the most fundamental difference in our species between male and female with either dominating or being dominated with either uh, superiority or inferiority with either being served or serving uh, and then they can generalize that to any other difference you know race religion ethnicity sexual orientation so it's not coincidental that there is a strong correlation between rigidly male dominated families typical of cultures or subcultures that orient to the domination side and also lots of prejudice against outgroups mm -hmm. so the uh, domination I had said authoritarian but you're saying it's more domination is the is the overall category social category and that really filters down through all parts of society right down into the family so that the the family is kind of structured around uh, domination you're mentioning uh, evangelicals which I actually grew up in an evangelical Christian uh, family so I'm kind of familiar with that uh, way of being well the good news is that not everybody brought up in that kind of environment and you're a good example uh, really identifies with it but many people do and you know this gendered system of values uh, is huge 
I mean, it, it, it really, you find that people who consider themselves very conservative, which I would say uh, is more aptly characterized as people who have this mindset of domination where there are only two alternatives. You either dominate or you're dominated and you identify with the strong authority figure, usually the father in the family, although it could be a mother, but then he's, her husband is supposed to be henpecked, you know, it's, it's, a, it's supposed to be an abnormality. So these people vote, they have no trouble voting for, for punitive policies, you know, prisons, or for weapons and wars, you know, this so-called masculine thing, but somehow they can't seem to find money or think it's right or even moral to fund stereotypically soft, caring, yeah, activities, this so-called women's work, right, of caring for children, uh, of caring uh, of, of, of preschool education. I mean, right now there's this big argument about uh, preschool education. And by the way, I just got back from Washington, D.C., uh, where the Center for Partnership Studies Caring Economy Campaign had a congressional briefing uh, in uh, you know on Capitol Hill, uh, which was wonderful. We had Congressman Jim Moran of Virginia uh, do the introduction, and I was on the panel. So was Steve Barnett, who is the co-director of the National Institute for Research on Early Childhood Education, showing that really not only from a human standpoint, but from a purely economic standpoint. Uh, caring, investing in caring for people and in educating people starting in early childhood is the best investment a nation can make. And maybe we can talk about that a little later. But staying yeah. with uh, this, with the different environments, you said that it filters down to the family. I would not say that. And I would say that it's an interactive process mm -hmm. and that mm -hmm. on the contrary, what children learn in families is foundational. Mm -hmm. So foundational. it's more interrelational. It's not like it just goes down from the top down, but that they support each other, the, the overall society and the family. So there's like an interaction going on there. They, it, it's uh, yeah, an interactive when, when when you're dealing with complex systems, and social systems are complex systems, mm -hmm. you can't really talk in terms of simple linear causes and effects. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. always what are the elements that support one another to maintain the character mm -hmm. of the system. And domination systems have three core components uh, as contrasted to partnership systems. One is this uh, authoritarian, top-down ranking in both the family and the state or tribe. The second is the rigid ranking of the male half of humanity over the female half and with it of anything stereotypically associated with masculinity and domination systems, you know, toughness, violence, domination, over the so-called soft, feminine, etc. And the third is a socially condoned, even idealized, high level of abuse and violence because without it, ultimately, the system won't last. Whereas as you move to the partnership side, and it's always a matter of degree, uh, it could be a tribal society like the uh, uh, Minangkabau. Uh, we had a little problem here, technical problem, but I want to uh, say that in the domination system, uh, as I said, you have to have uh, this uh, built-in, really, socially condoned, even idealized, high level of abuse and violence to maintain, ultimately, these rankings of domination. But as you move to the partnership side, which, and it's always a matter of degree, whether it's a tribal society like the Tedurai, or an agrarian society like the Minangkabau of Sumatra, or whether it is uh, societies that actually are today in the forefront of the movement towards partnership, like Sweden, Finland, Norway. Uh, these are societies where there is more uh, democracy and equality in both the family and the state, where the status of women is much higher, uh, 
so that 40% of the national legislatures are female. And they're in the forefront of trying to leave behind uh, traditions of domination and violence, uh, including the fact that the first peace studies came from these societies. And this is not coincidental. We're talking about a configuration of mutually reinforcing elements. Mm -hmm. OK. Uh, so we're going to uh, end right at this point, and then we're going to start. Uh, this is going to be one clip, and then we're going to pick up again in uh, another clip, so it'll be part two.